I'm Clarence Waldron. Welcome back to Black Muse. But before we get ready for tonight's show, I really want to give a special thank you and a, an acknowledgement to Howard Sandifer and Darlene Sandifer, the founders of the Chicago West Community Music Center on the west side of Chicago, for coming up with this idea of doing a video podcast. They said, let's get up close and personal with some of our favorite celebs and newsmakers. So with that in mind, tonight we have Mr. Maurice White. He is the son of the late, great Granville White, better known as Granny White. He was the first Black executive at Columbia Records and also the first Black executive in the entire music industry. He handled everybody from Aretha Franklin, Johnny Mathis, Tony Bennett, Mahalia Jackson, the gospel legend from Chicago, as well as Earth and a Fire and a whole lot more. But I'm gonna stop talking and let you meet and hear the words of Mr. Maurice White. Hey Maurice, what's up? Good afternoon, hello everybody. Okay, all right. So of course your father had to face a lot of challenges as a black man in the uh, music industry at that time. Can, did, do you have any idea of what he was facing back in the 50s and 60s? Uh, yeah, he had no blueprint. Uh, segregation was real. Uh, I remember him telling me a story because he was the only black record executive at CBS Records. They were holding a convention in New Orleans and he could only be in the hotel in the daytime. In the evening, he had to stay out in the black neighborhoods. And then in the day he could come back in. I remember another story. He and Tony Bennett were very close to each other and they were in Miami. And Tony Bennett had this big suite down in South Beach. And he said, hey, Granny, why don't you come stay with me? Well, when they walked into the hotel, the uh, security guard asked, can I help you? And Tony Bennett said, he's with me, is there a problem? And they said, no, sir, Mr. Bennett. So he got to stay in the hotel because Tony Bennett allowed him to do that. In my own career, Frankie Avalon, you guys might remember him from the Beach Party movies. We went to a country club on 95th Street, which will remain nameless. And um, when I walked in with Frankie, they asked, and this is in the 70s, they asked me, uh, can we help you? And Frankie said, he's with me. And they said, okay, Mr. Avalon, no problem. So I faced it even into the 70s, seeing that same scenario. Wow. Wow. So when did you realize that your father was doing something very special and exciting career? When, when did that hit you? I always knew he was something special. I just didn't know how special. Um, most people, and even myself, would have been glad to have just known him. I got to call him dad. And um, um, in the midst of all the things that I was doing, um, probably around 21, 22, when I really was entrenched in the music business. I got in around 19, but when I really got in, 20-ish, 21, and I saw him do things and people approach him that I looked at on a pedestal to, and he was like, oh, I taught him this is how to do his expenses, or I taught him this, or I taught him that, and I'm like, oh my God, uh, that's so-and-so, and he's like, huh. And, but um, I saw him have the ability to open doors that most people couldn't open. And these are people that were his peers that couldn't get any, but if he called, the people would acknowledge him. So it, it, it was um, very enlightening, but it was also touching to realize that. And then after he passed, I saw a whole nother level of who he was. I didn't know that Lena Horn and 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 I knew Duke Ellington, but Lena Horn and uh, Josephine Baker, uh, uh, Quincy Jones, these were all his friends. And I didn't know this. I mean, I knew he knew a lot of people, but I just had no idea of the magnitude of people he knew. And they they called each other by first name too. So right, right, right. Okay. Now, when you were a little kid, he always had albums around the house. What kind of things was he playing? Do you remember? 
You know, that's a funny question because I really don't remember my father playing music in the house. It was us, me and my sisters and brothers. We played it. And then um, back then, records, we had so much and so many of them. They came in different colors. The vinyl was red, green, orange. And we lived on a, in a two-story building. And my brother and I, we actually created Frisbees. We used to take the, the uh, records and fly them off the porch to see how far they would fly, not knowing we were creating something. But the neighbors started complaining about all these broke records on their porches and stuff mm -hmm. across the alley. But uh, uh, it, it, I don't remember him playing records, but we played them. You know, as I said, my sisters and my brother, uh, we would listen to stuff. Okay. Now, your father started working in the stock room in 1947 at Columbia Records. Correct. Who heard, yeah. Who, who heard of him and said he knew a lot about music or business and transferred him up to, promoted him to marketing and promotions? Um, I don't actually know who did that, but I know that his persistence shined, and that's what they noticed. And they just kept promoting him and promoting him. And then they had no black music department. And they, since he was the only black person in the house that was uh, uh, being acknowledged, they just made him head of it. Um, so to say who did that, I'm really not sure. But I knew that he had a special way with people. And I saw it many times. And this is not to sound disrespectful to anyone. But I saw people almost bow when he came in a room because of what they thought of him. And it was pure respect. And it, it was amazing to me to see it. Wow, wow. So now let's go through the list of all the many artists that he handled at Columbia. So Aretha Franklin was one of them. Who else? She said at our breakfast table when she was 17 with rollers in her hair. Um, Johnny Mathis, Tony Bennett, Earth, Wind and Fire, the whole Philadelphia International Catalog, Teddy Pendergrass, the OJs, Harold um, um, Melvin and the Blue Notes. Um, and even though artists might not have been on the label he was working for, they were all his friends. Um, Barry White, um, it's so many of them, I can't name them all because they all knew him because of who he was. There was a uniqueness too about what he was doing at that time, my father had the notoriety like an artist because people thought so much. If you pull up Barry Gordy's book, he talks about my father and how he tried to hire him and my dad wouldn't leave Columbia. If you go in Mahalia Jackson's book, she talks about my father and what she thought of him. I had the luxury to meet Barry Gordy one day um, and I went over to him and this was only maybe about eight or nine years ago. And I walked up to him and I said, Mr. Gordy, I want to thank you for having put my father in your book. And he said, who was your father? I said, Granny White, he would not let my hand go. He kept shaking my hand and kept, and there were people lined up that wanted to talk to him. And he just kept talking to me. He was like, that's your daddy. I, and he went to tell me what he thought of my father and how, what he meant to him. And I was like, whoa, that, that meant a lot to me. Wow, wow, wow. Mm. Now, Johnny Mathis, it gave me a great quote about Granville White. I do remember that Granville White was always very gracious and helpful to me and my career. Anything you can say about Johnny Mathis and your father? Or did your father talk about him at all or no? Uh, yes, in the beginning of his career, they didn't know what to do with Johnny Mathis. They didn't know what kind of artist he was gonna be. And I want to say it was wonderful. Was his first hit record or Misty? I think it was wonderful though. Wonderful, wonderful, yes. Anyway, he came to Chicago in January with uh, a t-shirt on and some gym shoes and no socks. And my father bought him a coat. And years later, Johnny Mathis sent him a check in a frame saying, here's a dollar deposit back on the coat you bought me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Now, Aretha Franklin just absolutely adored your father. You know, she said, Granny was one of the first important men at Columbia Records. African-Americans were almost unheard of at major companies other than the artists. He was a fun-loving and straight-up businessman. 
we had great promo schedules back in the day. She was very professional and on the money. And so is Maurice. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Granny took me to meet and be interviewed by all the DJs, including Herb Kent, when I was a teenager. What are your, what are your thoughts about Aretha? They were so close to each other. They were sister and brother. And I remember sitting, um, she had left Columbia. She had went to Atlantic. And Call Me was the number one record in the country. And I was sitting on the couch next to my father. And she called him. And she said, Granny, I want you to be my manager. And he turned her down. And I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this woman got the biggest record in the country. She's this, that, and the other. And I asked him, I said, Dad, why did you do that? He said, I'm thinking about my family. She's one person. If I leave this company and something happens to her, what happens to my family? So I have um, um, been here all these years. And even though I'm honored and she's my friend and, and my sister and I'll do anything I can for her, um, I'm thinking about the family as opposed to me. I, in my own career, would have taken that opportunity, but that's me, I'm not my father. And um, I respect his decisions, even down to never moving to New York and had many opportunities to go to New York and, and, and um, different people were brought in above him and none of them ever touched him, first of all, because they knew the, the uh, importance that he played in, in, inside the company. But um, the fact that he, um, he never chose to go to New York. And I asked him that question. And he said to me, because black people, they're only gonna let you go so high. And then at a certain point, you're out. I moved to New York, I'm out after they get done with me. I can stay out here in the field and do whatever I wanna do and still have the same influence that I have if I was in New York. At the time, once again, I didn't understand that, but now I do, I get it. Wow, wow, wow. I'm just curious, have you seen the Aretha film or the, the no. mini series? No, I haven't seen it. Um, I, some people have told me their, their input behind it. And I'm, I'm torn between wanting to see it because I know things that I'm sure is not in there. And it might dishearten me to see, you know how TV makes things look good. And it might just not settle well with me knowing that that's a bunch of crap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go back to Mahalia Jackson. So you said that in several books, she mentioned how your father helped her. Can yes. you recall anything? Give us a sneak preview of what was said in the book or anything well, like that? Um, one story that comes to mind, um, they called him, she called him White and because his name was Granville White and that was his, her nickname. But if you read in her book, she's referencing him in several times. Anyway, uh, her and Duke Ellington were having a conversation one day and uh, she said, I want you to meet this guy named Whitey. And, and he said, Whitey, she said, yeah, Granville White. She said, girl, I know him already. That's my friend. And they kind of laughed about it, but uh, that's in the book. Okay, okay. So now you're in the music business. You know, you're fo following in your father's footsteps. Sort of take us through your career, you know, Let's go back because I think you were with RCA at one time and all yes, those different labels. Yes, I was. Yeah. Um, I started in 1977. I worked for Eddie Thomas, Thomas and Associates, which, by the way, Eddie Thomas was the founder of Kurt Tone Records with Curtis Mayfield. And um, Eddie had left Curtis and had started his own ventures. And I went to work for Eddie. I worked for him for about a year, left there and went to Progress Record Distributors, which was locally. They would start a new distribution company. When I got there, the first record I ever worked was Disco Duck. And we had one record company. And when I left there two and a half years later, we had over 250 labels um, from Fantasy to Motown to London Records. I mean, my experience working there was phenomenal. That's where I met Frank, Frankie Avalon. That's where I, I met Pavarotti. I actually got a chance to meet Pavarotti and go to one of his concerts, which was amazing to me because I had never sat and saw something like that, but I got a chance to meet him. Um, I worked with Sylvester and Two Tons of Fun. 
uh, didn't know the magnitude that Sylvester would carry and in opening that genre of music. And um, then leaving there, I went to go work for Polydor Records and I stayed there a year and a half. Uh, we had Ray Goodman and Brown, Special Lady, Peaches and Herb. Um, I Will Survive, Gloria Gaynor, Isaac Hayes. Uh, we had hit after hit. And I left there and started my own company. Notice I'm not staying too long. Grass isn't growing under my feet, but because I become restless, I, um, I have this energy level that I see things. And uh, I remember my dad telling me, um, son, you got a great job. Why are you leaving? And I told him, I'm young enough to go back if I need to. Right now, I need to try this. And he looked at me and was like, go for it. Keep in mind, he had worked for the same company for 36 years. So leaving a company is unheard of, even down to my in-laws and, and, and other people of that era. When you found a good job, you kept it. I was like, I want to try something else. Plus, I, I had this entrepreneurial spirit in me. I always wanted to be the boss. And um, I kind of like that position. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, your daughter is also in the music industry. Yes, what is she doing now? This is Granville's granddaughter. Right. Yes. My daughter, uh, Alexis White, she uh, worked for Epic Records for four years. Well, first of all, she worked for me for five years after she graduated from college. We couldn't find her a job. And I said, well, you come work for me. And for five years, she worked for me. Then she got a job at Epic Records. She was there for two years and transferred over to Rock Nation. Then an interesting ha thing happened. One day they came in and fired the whole staff after about a year, everybody got fired. And she was so distraught about it. And I, I said, this is no fault of yours. You didn't do anything wrong. It was what that company chose to do at that moment. So after about 60 days, I grabbed her and said, listen to me, what God do you serve? And God doesn't take you someplace and drop you. He takes you someplace because he has something else for you. Short of the story, she started her own company now and she's doing marketing and promotion. And she's working for every major record company on it. So wow. things happen wow. for a reason and why they happen. We, we can't tell at that moment. However, the goodness is there. And if you notice in the Bible, it always talked about, it always talks about victory. And I've had to point that out to it. It ends in victory. So if you're gonna win, just stay the course. And she's doing fantastic right now. I'm very proud of her. And uh, some days I think she thinks I work for her. <laughs> She'll say some stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. So now going back to your father, he died in 1996. Right. At age 69. Correct. Um, what did he leave you? What did your father leave you? And that actually sounds like a little book title, but what did your father leave you in terms of information, in terms of advice, in terms of how to live? Just what did he leave you? Integrity, uh, honor your word, no matter how small it is. Uh, you never know what's important to somebody else. And you might think it's nothing. And uh, he showed me that constantly, how if somebody, if you take on an assignment, do the best that you can to complete that assignment. And you never know where it's gonna take you. And people notice that. Um, I could never attempt to be who he was. Um, he was bigger than life itself to me. Forget that he was my father, but I saw him have the ability to interact with people that amazed me. And um, he showed me that. And I've tried to pass that on to my kids. I have two daughters actually. And uh, uh, my youngest is who works in the music business, but my oldest and my grandson, who we're letting him do some rap music right now because his grades are pretty good. But I told him, this is not your job. This is a hobby right now. If it, if you should make money from it, then it becomes a job. But right now, I want you to think purely on school and I'm letting you do this because it's a hobby. So <laughs> don't okay. get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. What, what would be your father's legacy to today? How would he like to be remembered? 
by the men and women in the industry or just Black America? That he forged and paved the way without a blueprint. That he did what he had to do to exist and to let the music shine, to let our music come to light. When he started, it was still called race music and um, that he put it in the forefront. And my father, his best friend was Carl Davis, who was my godfather. And Carl Davis produced the Dells, the Shy Lights, Walter Jackson, Gene Chandler, um, one of the greatest producers of that era. And, and that I watched these men, uh, once again, had no blueprint. They just carved a way out of nothing. And to be remembered as that they made a footprint. I think he would also be saddened to see where music is right now, because some of this stuff, thank God we make money from it. Because it just, I call it the McDonald's era. It's fast food. You eat it, you digest it, and then you own something else. I just read an article this morning, ironically, and was talking about catalog music and that radio stations, um, there's you know all these stations that are doing very well, but these catalogs are selling still at these record companies. This, in this particular article, this guy was saying, he was in a restaurant the other day, and these kids that were working in there were 30 and younger, and um, um, they were playing music out of the 70s and 80s. And he said they were walking around singing and stuff, and he asked one of the girls, why are you guys playing this music? They said, because we like it. Uh, well, you know, it's essence to that music. They, the way they recorded, uh, the, the musicians that played on the stuff were all stars in their own rights, and they added essence to it. That, quite frankly, was part of the uh, success of Motown. Everybody at Motown, um, pretty much from the guitar player to the drummer, was an artist themselves, and they brought their own significant uh, individual uh, concepts to a song that made it what it was. So um, I think though he would look back and say, boy, I'm glad I came up in that time and not now. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, how did he spend his retirement? He retired in 1983 after 36 years. What? How did he spend his days, his, you know, his months, years, do you think? Uh, oh, they uh, started another record company, he and Carl Davis, and, uh, oh. and called Veteran Records, and they did three albums on the Dells, and uh, he consulted a lot of different people. People would call him and ask him, um, you know, how to approach stuff. So he, okay. retirement, mm, I don't know if you call it that. Right. Um, he wasn't punching a clock, but uh, he still was part of the record business, so. Right, okay. So before we end, you got to say something about your mother because behind every great man, there's a woman. So tell me anything about your mother. What kind of woman was she? I mean, my gosh. And how many kids did, did they have? Six kids and my mom was a rock. She kept the house. My dad was always on the road. So my mom was uh, the judge and the jury. She kept us all in line. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, Woolworths used to have these like concession stands, little counters where you used to eat at if you went in Woolworths. And one day we went in there to get some food and my mother said, give everybody hot dogs. And I went to say, I don't want a hot dog. And before I could get it out of my mouth, she had smacked me. I was getting up off the floor and saying, I'll take that hot dog, okay? But, <laughs> but okay. To, to deal with six kids, okay? And I think that's a discipline that we're missing right now. You know, you strike a child right now, and the child want to call the police on you. Well, had you tried that with my mom, uh, you would have been really beat up before they got there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> She was the law and order, but it's what kept us in line and made us respect our elders. And um, um, I remember her always keeping the house in order. We always had, even though we weren't rich, but we didn't know that, we always had money. I remember going to school every day with lunch money and 
could buy a carton of milk and cookies and stuff. And I remember kids in school couldn't afford stuff like that. I didn't know it. It was mm. just a lesson she always had it for. So she ran our house and she kept it in order. And my dad couldn't have did what he did without having my mom in our house at front. Okay. All right. Anything else you want to share while we got you here? Anything else on your mind that I did not ask you that you wish that I did? Now's your time. <laughs> uh, uh, I hope that we take control of the music that we're doing now and give it more substance and not so much um, superficial, you know, uh, jewelry and sex and rock and roll. Let's talk about things that are relevant to the times that we're going through right now, because this is a terrible time and music is so influential and these guys don't know how much they influence people. So let's tell them something wholesome too, somewhere up under there. Let's give them something um, that people could actually run with. All right, good enough, well said. So thank you very much, sir. I've enjoyed myself thoroughly. This has been my a great pleasure. one. My pleasure, my pleasure. And thank you for having me and congratulations to Black Muse.